Amen. I'm not sure there's a more powerful hymn out there than that one. I just love that one. Please turn with me, if you will, to the book of Acts, chapter 10. Double digits, folks. We're making some headway. How about that? Acts, chapter 10. I don't know how any of us in this room came to faith in Christ in the sense of, I don't know your personal testimony or your personal story. For most of you, I know some of you, of course, some of you grew up in a Christian household. Some of you came to faith in Christ later in life by um, maybe some sort of even extraordinary means where God has brought about salvation. I was thinking of a professor that I had at Mid-America who was living for the devil, living like a reprobate, found himself inside of a room, found a gospel tract just sitting there in the room. And as he was sitting there with the gospel tract in the room, he started reading it. And that night came under immense conviction of the Holy Spirit through that gospel tract and then gave his life to Christ and became a follower of Jesus Christ. And I'm just amazed at all the stories that are out there of different people giving their testimony of how they came to faith in Christ. Some of it very normative, some of it very regular, um, and some of it sort of extraordinary in the way that it was presented. (coughs) Pardon me. But I think what we're going to see this morning as we go through this particular passage of Scripture, that God is doing something that's relatively extraordinary in the sense that he is going out of his way um, in order to bring something together uh, because he is establishing something that he commanded from the very beginning of this chapter and, and articulated or this book and that he said he was going to do. In Acts chapter 1 verse 8 Jesus is telling his disciples, he says, remain in Jerusalem and you will be until the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, (coughs) and to the uttermost parts of the earth. Man, all of a sudden, one of those dry mouth tickle things. (coughs) Forgive me. And so we're going to see today how God is beginning to sovereignly work out his plan in this area. As we look in Acts chapter 10, verses 1 through really kind of the end of the chapter, but we're going to look at verses 1 through 23 today as sort of the introductory part of that. So stand with me this morning as we read Acts chapter 10, verses 1 through 23, looking at this part of this first part of this account of God beginning to work the Gentiles coming into the kingdom of God. Verse 1, it says, At Caesarea there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion of what was known as the Italian cohort. A devout man who feared God and all his household gave alms generously to the people and prayed continually to God. About the ninth hour of the day, He saw clearly in a vision an angel of God come in and say to him, Cornelius, and he stared at him in terror and said, What is it, Lord? And he said to him, Your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa and bring one Simon who is called Peter. He is lodging with one Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the sea. When the angel who spoke to him (coughs) had departed, he called the two of his servants um, and, a, and a devout soldier from among those who attended him. And having related everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. The next day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the housetop about the sixth hour to pray. And, when he, be- and he became hungry and wanted something to eat. But while they were preparing it, he fell into a trance. And saw the heavens opened and something like a great sheet descending, being let down by its four corners upon the earth. In it were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill, and eat. And Peter said, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice came to him again a second time, What God has made clean, do not call common. This happened three times, and the thing was taken up at once into heaven. 
Now, while Peter was inwardly perplexed as to what the vision um, he had seen might mean, behold, the men who were sent by Cornelius, having made inquiry for Simon's house, stood at the gate and called out to ask whatever Simon or whether Simon, who was called Peter, was lodging there. And while Peter was pondering the vision, the spirit said to him, behold, three men are looking for you. Rise and go down and accompany them without hesitation, for I have sent them. And Peter went down to the men and said, I am the one who are you looking for. What is the reason for your coming? And they said, Cornelius, a centurion, an upright and God-fearing man, who is well spoken of by the whole Jewish nation, was directed by a holy angel to send for you to come to his house to hear what you have to say. So he invited them to in to be his guests. This is the word of the Lord given to us under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, penned according to the uh, writer Luke. May we receive it with the authority that it carries. It is the word of God. You may be seated. <clears throat> Thank you very much. <laughs> you folks are so sweet. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, as we come before you this morning... We thank you for this passage of scripture that is before us. We thank you for the promise that it is going to articulate and the wonderful truths that are there for us. I pray that you would open our minds and our hearts to receive them this morning, Lord. Remove the blinders from our eyes, from our ears, from our minds, Lord. May we understand your word. I pray that you would give me the words to speak this morning and when you're finished, close my mouth. Lord, these are your words and we want to not do any violence or damage to the text, but help me to preach faithfully this morning according to your word, Father. Lord, I pray that this would be a wonderful passage for all of us for encouragement, but for instruction, and even in the sense of conviction, Lord, may it come upon us as necessary. And Lord, may your word go forth and not return to you void. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen and amen. This is such a cool passage of scripture to me because of how God is working out this plan as he's going through all of the regions under the uttermost parts of the earth we're seeing that begin to take shape to come to fruition now according to what he promised in Acts chapter 1 as now the gospel is going to go to the Gentiles and there's going to be a major focus kind of from this point on that's going to be about the Gentiles. In fact, up to this point, we've really only seen how the focus has been Jewish people. Even as they've gone up to Samaria, the church in Jerusalem and the Jewish church has really been the main focus of the book to this point in time. But now we're going to see a major break happen here as we see the gospel is now going out to the uttermost parts of the earth. And as the... the um, persecution has hit the church of Jerusalem and scattered them to these various areas, we're going to see that as persecution is going to continue, that there's going to even become sort of a new hub for Christianity, which once was Jerusalem, that becomes this church up in Antioch, which now becomes the sending church for Paul and Barnabas and Silas and all these missionaries out to the uttermost parts of the earth. So we're entering into this interesting transitional time. But God doesn't do this without a little bit of fanfare. He doesn't do this without a little bit of extraordinary circumstances. We're going to see how God is going to sovereignly orchestrate and bring about the redemption of the Gentiles through his apostle Peter. Notice also that we've gone back to, as we talked about last week, the focus is off of Paul for the moment. It's back on to Peter. And I think it's interesting that Peter seems to be present in all of these places where the gospel is now going to these different groups. Remember that Philip is preaching in Samaria and they're becoming believers and things like that. But what happened whenever Peter got there? When Peter got there, that's when the Holy Spirit came down. And so we see Peter almost the sort of leading the way among the apostles. He's one of the inner three that always went with Jesus, Peter, James, and John. And then Peter and John were a great influence at the beginning of this book. How it's Peter and John preaching in the temple and doing these minor works. We're going to see a little bit about James in a couple of chapters here. It's not good for James, unfortunately, but we're going to see these things happen. But we see how Peter has sort of been the one present 
every time that piece of Acts chapter 1 is being fulfilled. And so here he is, and it's through Peter that God is going to do this miraculous work. Whenever I do my study, I always do my own study first. And after I do my own study first, I don't rely upon just Steve Renner because he doesn't have all the answers or all the details of things. I look at commentaries and other things, and I also listen to a lot of other preachers like on YouTube or something like that, and I hear, what do they think about the passage? What are they saying about the passage? This was one of those really disappointing ones as I was looking there, because usually John MacArthur's my go-to guy. Well, he doesn't have anything on YouTube from this, or I couldn't find it anyway. So I was listening to some other guys, and listen to these guys try to preach this passage. It broke my heart. And I'm not saying this to say, I look at how awesome I am, and I'm much better at preaching this passage than other people. But what I'm saying is I was so sad at how many people sort of missed the point of what's going on in this passage, uh, in this story. A lot of people are saying things like, the Church of Jerusalem is being disobedient, and so they're not reaching the Gentiles like they were supposed to reach the Gentiles. And so God's got to do this extraordinary thing to bring Peter and say, now go get the Gentile. That's not the case at all. There's no disobedience that's been happening. Everything's been happening sovereignly according to the plan of God. And this is no exception. The other ones was all about, about how, how look at what a man with a good heart can do in the kingdom of God. And look, because Cornelius had such a good heart and he was so seeking after God and things like that, God, you know, is like, okay, we're going to reach out to the Gentiles now. No, 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 no. We don't move the hand of God, folks. The hand of God moves us. And so that's what we see happening here is that at the beginning, as we look at here, verses 1 through 8, as we start to recap, we're going to see how God has already been grabbing on to Cornelius' heart and beginning to mold him and fashion him and prepare him to receive the gospel. Remember the parable that Jesus told about a man going out to sow some seed in a field, and how did the seed fall? Some of it fell on the path, on a stony heart that's not receptive to the gospel at all. Because why? Because God has not cultivated that heart to receive it. How some falls upon thorny ground or rocky ground, and those people seem to give some sort of reception of the word, but after time they fall away because of the worldly pleasures or because of difficulties, and they don't really stick with it. But then there's the fertile soil, the good soil, the soil that God has cultivated, that is made ready to receive the word of God, so that way Whenever the person hears it and receives it, they receive it with joy. Why? Because God has sovereignly given them the faith and the ability to receive it with joy. He's been working on their heart. And so we do preach the gospel everywhere to all people. We've been commanded to do so. But we know that all 100% of the results are up to God. You see what I'm saying? We can't thwart God's plan, but he has invited us into the work that he himself is doing as he is sovereignly doing it over all of his creation. And so we see this here in verse 1. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion of what was known as the Italian cohort. Caesarea. This is the Caesarea which is sort of the capital of the Roman presence in Judea. This is where we find ourselves. This is where Pontius Pilate is sitting on his seat of authority, is in Caesarea. And so here it doesn't surprise us that we would see a Roman centurion, an Italian cohort, major leader guy hanging out here in this place. So we see contextually and pro providentially, I don't know how you say that, um, that he's there because, of course, this is where you would expect to see a centurion is in this Roman center of Judea. But this guy's different. So a centurion is a guy who's, who oversaw up to like 6,000 potential soldiers. This is a man of high rank and authority. Sometimes I wonder, is this the same centurion whose servant was healed by Jesus earlier on? I don't know. We, don't, we have no idea if it's the same guy or not. But it makes you wonder, because that guy that came to Jesus, you remember that story? My, my servant um, 
You know, and he says, don't come to my house. I'm not worthy for you to come into my house. Just say the word and I know my servant will be healed, you know, because I'm a man under, uh, under authority and, and, and knows how. And I say this person go there and they go there and this person go there and they go there. And so I know that with by your word, Jesus, you don't come into my house. You don't have to. I know that you can you can heal my servant because of the authority that I see in you. There's that story. Remember that? There's no no knowing if this is the same centurion or not but it could be you know so who knows but here's the guy he's he's a roman centurion he is a pagan you understand in the sense of upbringing he's a gentile he's a non-jew up to this point in time even the samaritans are sort of half jews this is the first complete real like you know this is this guy is a pure gentile Roman and an official even in the Roman leadership here. So we're talking about a real Gentile guy. This is a person who, if a Jew were to go into his household, he would be ceremonially unclean. He would not be able to go into the temple and worship because he went into the house of this goyim, this dirty, filthy, nasty Gentile person. So there's a huge divide happening here. There was a huge divide where even Jews weren't even supposed to go into the household of that. If they did, they couldn't go into the temple later. So we're talking about this is a kind of a far as you can be from the kingdom of God sort of person, according to the mindset of a Jewish person during this time. You following me? You're here with me? So this is sort of like one of the most unlikely people to ever be the person to receive the gospel of Jesus Christ or to ever be counted as somebody who is being brought into the covenant kingdom of God. And that reminds me, as we think about this by way of application, we all also might some know somebody who we think is the most unlikely person to be someone who would come into the kingdom of God under the covenant headship of God. Yes, in the sovereign hand of God, because it's the power of God that changes hearts and souls and minds. We'll find out. I'm going to give the answer at the end. He gets saved, folks, okay? He gets saved. He comes to faith in Christ. But you need to know that this is a reminder to us that nobody, nobody is too far from the grace of God. Nobody is. That if God chooses to elect whomever to salvation, he will. Think of all the people that we've seen in history. People like um, John Newton, right? Am I saying the right name? I am saying, right? Amazing Grace guy? Thank you very much. All right. He used to be a slave owner, you know, and he was, I mean, he was a reprobate man. He wasn't just a slave owner. He put slave owners to shame. You know, he was really wicked. And then he, uh, he, he came to Christ. I mean, I imagine during that time, everybody thought to themselves, John Newton, there's no way he would ever become a Christian. And yet God rescued him and he gave us one of the most classic and wonderful hymns in the history of the church because of what God did in his life. And I want us to think about that. That who is that person in your life? Who is that the person that you know? Who's the most down and dirty, die hard, reprobate, nasty, whatever person that you know that is somebody who might just be ripe for the kingdom of God? You see what I mean? And so be praying for that person. Don't give up on that person. Continue to share the gospel with that person. Continue to have compassion. Uh, you know, I think about the world that we live in right now, which is insane. And everybody knows that it's insane, right? The other thing we know is that it's completely unsustainable. This is all going to come crashing down. All the secularism, all the sexual immorality, transgenderism, all this stuff, it's all going to come crashing down. It's not going to last because it's not of God and it's antithetical to God and he will judge it. It's all going to come crashing down. How is the church going to respond in the time that it comes crashing down? We need to be ready not with I told you so's and, and vindictiveness and meanness toward people, but ready to love them into the kingdom of God. When they finally come to their senses and we say, and they say, I've gone down this road, I've cut off parts of my body, and it left me more empty now 
than I was whenever I started this pursuit. And we come with the gospel and we say, but we do have the real answer, the actual answer. Repent and believe and you can be saved. Regardless of how badly you've mutilated yourself, regardless of how badly you've rebelled against God, you can find compassion. You can find salvation. You can find purpose and life in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so just like Cornelius, it's the most Gentile of Gentiles. He's a Roman pagan centurion, and he gets saved. Fill in the blank of anybody out there and ask yourself, are they too lost to be saved? Are they too far gone to be saved? And the answer is, of course, no. So let's be ready to love the people when they finally come to their senses, when they start to let go of some of the pride, and they realize that, I'm empty. I've got nothing. And we're ready to love them with the gospel of Jesus Christ into the kingdom of God. So, okay, verse one. All right, we got a long way to go. A devout man, but this guy's different. Okay, so here we go. We find out more about Cornelius. He was a devout man who feared God with all of his household, gave alms generously to the people, and prayed continually to God. This is who the ancient church or the ancient Jewish people would refer to as a God-fearer. Okay, he is recognizing the one true God. He's abandoned Jupiter and he's abandoned Saturn and Mars and all the gods, the pantheon of the Romans. And he recognizes the God of the Jewish people, the God, this God, you know, the Lord, Yahweh, okay, the covenant God of the Jewish nation is the God. He's the true God. And so he's, he is a, a God-fearer, but he's not gone all the way into Judaism. He hasn't been circumcised. He's not keeping the law, so to speak, but he's a God-fearer. Um, and so this is who we find him as. But we see him, he's praying to God continually. And that's what happens in verse 3. About the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God come in and say to him, Cornelius... How about that? The most alienated or one of the most alienated Gentile people, according to the people of God, and God comes to him and he knows his name. God knows your name. He knows you. He knows you better than you know yourself. What a wonderful thing to be called by name. You're not just a number. You're not just a person, like a blip in the sea of humanity, so to speak. You're not a nothing or a nobody. You have a name. And God knows it. He knew Cornelius' name. And he knows yours. And if you're in him, not only does he know your name, but your name's written down. It's written down in the Lamb's Book of Life. Remember that wonderful story of Jesus sending out the 72? And they're like, oh my gosh, we, we saw demons cast out in your name, and we saw healings, we saw all these things. And Jesus basically says, so what? <laughs> he said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Don't rejoice over your power over the demons, but rejoice that your name is written down in the Lamb's book of life. You see, that's why we rejoice. And I love this. I love this. He knows Cornelius' name. He knows him, you see. He's not just a face in a sea of faces. He's a person known by God, intimately known by God just like you are, and just like the person that drives you the most insane in your world, and just like the person who is living really reprobate rebellion against God right now. He knows their name too. And man, praise God that he saves wicked folks like you and me after knowing our name and calling us out of darkness and into his kingdom. And he stared at him in terror, <laughs> which I would too. Uh, what is it, Lord? And he said to him, your, your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa and bring one Simon who is called Peter. He is lodging with one Simon, a tanner, who is, whose house is by the sea. 
When the angel had spoke to him, he departed, and he called two of his servants, and a devout soldier among them also attended him. And having related everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. I love how it says that your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. The word memorial there is a great, great word. It means just remembrance, a remembrance. And it's a picture of God coming to him saying, I have heard and I am remembering your prayers. You see, you see what I'm saying? Um, we have wonderful testimony of this in other places in the scripture. If you look in Luke chapter 1, that there's a man by the name of Zechariah whose wife's name is Elizabeth. And one day, Zechariah is in the temple and he's offering incense before God and suddenly an angel shows up and he goes, Zechariah, the Lord's heard your prayer. You're going to have a son. <laughs> and Zechariah's like, what are you talking about? I prayed that like 40 years ago when my wife was still of childbearing age. What are you talking about? You know, and so, but he, God's heard your prayer, but the idea, you know what Zechariah means in Hebrew? The Lord remembers. The Lord remembers. And so what's he doing? Through the Lord is remembering his covenant to Israel and is going to bring about John the Baptist who is then going to be the person to, to herald the king, Jesus, coming, right? And so the Lord remembers, but he uses the Lord remembers to, and remembers his prayer. You see what I'm saying? How awesome is this? How he's hearing his prayer, but it's not in the time that Zechariah wanted him to hear it, but it was the time that God deemed necessary to do so. In the book of Zechariah, which is the last, second to last book of the Old Testament, is a prophet wildly difficult book to understand probably more so than revelation i think and so but that's the same name the lord remembers it's lord remembering his covenant with his people and so here the lord is remembering the prayers of cornelius because it says not just that this time he was praying but he continued to pray he continued to pray day by day by day he's in prayer and then god shows up one day with an angel and says i've heard your prayer I remember your prayer. That is a terribly important testimony to those of us in this room. That we also ought to be continuously people who are praying. We ought to be continuously seeking the Lord in prayer. Every day, all the time. And trusting in the fact that God will meet us and our needs according to his providential time and purpose. You see what I'm saying? That the Lord is remembering your prayers. You are not just praying and it's bouncing off the ceiling and not getting any further. No, no, no. By faith, we know and we understand because God said so. Anything you pray in the name of the Lord, he will hear it. You know what I'm saying? He will answer it, right? Okay. It is having an effect, even if you're not seeing it right now. My, Cornelius is praying day by day by day by day by day by day. But in the providence of God, in the perfect timing of his working on his plan of salvation and redemption for all of his people, this is the time that he is now answering his prayer. So trust in the Lord and trust in the fact that when he's answering your prayers or not answering your prayers in the way that you think he should answer your prayers, that he's doing it sovereignly according to his plan. And he is remembering and he is hearing and all of this is not in vain. So continue in prayer. And even if you feel like dry and not really in the mood to pray, Pray anyway, you see, keep going, keep sticking with it because you are, there is more happening through the prayers that you are praying than what you think. And God may answer something that you prayed for a long time ago, way far in the future, because he's doing it according to his sovereign plan and his redemption. That child whom you're praying for, who is rebelling against God and walking away, that child can be rescued and he may answer that prayer still one day. I'm still praying for people in my family who are still lost. And I've been praying for them for 20 years that they would come to faith in Christ. Some who have, praise God, he's answered some prayers in that sense now. And I continue to pray for a couple of people in my life who I know are lost. 
For 20 years I've been praying for them in the hopes that God will one day answer that prayer according to that. That when the God remembers that prayer one day, that he will bring about that salvation. So we ought to have that in mind. Understanding that God is working in the creation according to the prayers of his people. He's invited us in to that wonderful work that he's doing, but he's also accomplishing all of these things according to his sovereign plan and timing. But don't give up and don't quit and don't think it's not having an effect because it is, even if you don't see it right this moment, okay? Our God is not a fast food microwave God, <laughs> and he's not Burger King God either. It's, it's, you don't always get it your way, you know what I'm saying? But he does it according to his sovereign plan and his timing. So we see here, this is the time he's going to answer the prayer. And look at this, he's going to do so by his people. That is what I think is also very important that we recognize here. That at this moment in time, the angel could have, you know, preached the gospel to him, said, believe in Jesus and you'll be saved. Or he could have just had a vision to do so. But he doesn't do it that way. He does it according to the man of God and using the word of God we're going to see as it happens. Whenever we see, we hear the stories, the testimonies of the people in the Middle East having dreams and Jesus is showing up in their dreams, they're not instantly waking up saved, but what are they doing? They're going to find the missionary that happens to be right around the block or down the corner. And then they're meeting with them and they're having the gospel preached to them. And then they're being saved. We don't, we're not hyper Calvinists here, folks. Okay. Hyper Calvinism is error. Hyper Calvinism is heretical. It's, it's, it's heterodox. God saves people by means of preaching the word of God to them and through the people of God being obedient to do those things. Can God save anybody at any time, any way that he wants to? Yes, he can. And we have a couple of examples of that. Paul, obviously, being the one where Jesus knocked him down and said, you're following me. And Paul's like, okay, <laughs> you know, fine, I'll do that. But that's an extraordinary example. The ordinary means of why how God does this thing is through evangelism, through preaching the gospel, through the sending of missionaries. That's how the world is being one, teaching your children, all of these things. It's not by some miraculous dream sort of thing. Even though he can, that's not the means by which he has chosen. Because he always chooses those ordinary, faithful things to accomplish all of these things. What are we always preaching here? Ordinary means of grace. Prayer, proclamation of the word, Lord's Supper, all of these things for the growth of our, of, of our relationship with God. We use as ordinary, average, everyday things, just the same way as, you know, what's the difference between a white belt and a black belt? About 10,000 sidekicks, right? What, how, how do you get first place in the tournament yesterday? By swinging a golf club 50,000 times to get it right. That's how God does things. It's not different in the church than outside of the church. All the rest of our lives is it's built of uh, faithfulness, discipline, you know, uh, stick to itiveness, you know, perseverance, things like that. Well, it's the same thing in the church. It's the everyday, incremental, moment by moment, day by day mustard seed type growth, right? And the ordinary things like just going out and sharing the gospel with people. Just going out and telling somebody about Jesus. That's how he does these things. Okay? That's how he does these things. So, he's going to send Cornelius to go get, or you know, he's saying, go get this guy Simon, and he's going to come talk to you about things. Okay? So, Simon's down in Joppa. He's staying there. Um, and he's staying with a guy, another Simon, who is a tanner, which is really kind of interesting because even by God sovereignly having him stay in a tanner's house, he's already preparing him for what he's about to do because a tanner would be ceremonially unclean <laughs> to go into the temple because a tanner works with dead animals all day, every day. And if you touch dead things all the time, that makes you ceremonially unclean uh, to be able to go into the temple. And so now Simon's been staying with a guy in a house that's unclean already. So we already see even the preliminary stuff is happening there, okay? But what I think is really, really cool is that this house happens to be in Joppa. 
I love that this house is in Joppa. That is such a cool little um, way that God's working out this wonderful picture of what he's seen from the past. Read the Old Testament, folks. Read the Old Testament, please. Get in the Old Testament and read it. It's so rich and so good, and you miss so many wonderful little things if you're not in the Old Testament. There's a guy who's a minor prophet, happens to be staying in this little town called, oh, I don't know, Joppa. (laughs) And as he's staying in Joppa, he gets a call from God to do what? To go preach to the Gentiles. Go to Nineveh. Go preach to those Assyrians. Go preach the thing that I've told you to preach. So he uses the man of God staying in Joppa to go reach out to a bunch of Gentile people that they might repent of their wickedness. And here we have Peter, the man of God, staying in Joppa, who is now about to be called to go preach the gospel to a bunch of Gentiles that they might repent of their wickedness. You see, that stuff is just so cool, guys. I mean, you got, that is awesome. What a cool testimony how even in that moment, even the place where he's staying, even how God's going to launch his kingdom to the Gentiles is the same way that he did so many hundreds of years before that. That's such a cool testimony. Jonah, of course, said, "Uh -uh." (laughs) uh-uh. Had to be corrected first before he did so, but then he eventually went. And what happened in the city of Nineveh? They all repented. From the king to the animals. They even put sackcloth on the animals. They all repented, and God relented of the disaster he sought to bring upon them. And so here we see another picture of that same thing. So this is how we start to prepare this. The other thing we see happening here, which I think is very cool, is that God is bringing these two guys together, but he's doing it through the testimony of two witnesses, so to speak, in the sense of he starts by talking to Cornelius, and he says, go find Peter. And now he's going to start talking to Peter, and he's going to be like, there's this guy Cornelius looking for you, okay? So cool how God works us all out. Verse 9, the next day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the housetop about the sixth hour to pray, and he became hungry and wanted something to eat. But while they were preparing it, he fell into a trance. Okay, anybody been there? Been praying for a long time? Suddenly your stomach starts rumbling, or you start falling asleep or something? Anybody? Does everybody here pray perfectly without distractions or anything all the time? Because I sure don't, okay? I can really relate to this, where I'm praying and then, you know, it starts grumbling and I'm hungry. And because we're human and we live as humans and we're feeble and all of these things. And so, but in this particular case, this hunger was not meant to be a distraction. This hunger was meant to be an enhancement. Okay. The idea is God is allowing this hunger and he's using the hunger that's naturally happening while Peter is praying in order to bring about some sort of new revelation to Peter. And this is what he says. Or any, uh, and so, and so, and he became hungry. He wanted something to eat, but while he was preparing it, they were preparing it, he fell into a trance and he saw heavens open and something like a great sheet descending, being let down by its four corners upon the earth. And in it were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. We'll stop there for just a second. That's why I had Dalton read that Old Testament passage from Deuteronomy. Seems like, why would you have, why are we reading this? This doesn't make any sense. Why are we doing this, Steve? Well, that's the reason why. Because I wanted us to remember that contextually, Peter is still sort of under that Old Testament understanding of foods to eat. And so we read about that from Deuteronomy. It's also in Leviticus. That's the first reading of it. Um, And this is a whole list of foods that the people of Israel were not allowed to eat. Things like pork or rabbits or, you know, vultures or, you know, things along those lines. They weren't allowed to eat camels. They weren't allowed to eat reptiles and all of these different things. But now we see, as Peter is praying, the sheet comes down, and what's on there? Well, it's a whole bunch of clean and unclean foods. And he's like, rise, Peter, kill, and eat. And so he sees all kinds of food, but also reptiles and the birds of the air. So 
this is like Peter's like, whoa, <laughs> I don't think so, Lord, because I you you is this a test? <laughs> you know, am I supposed to say no? Because I'm saying no. I think I'm supposed to say no, because I know that according to Leviticus, according to Deuteronomy, I'm not allowed to eat these animals. But um in verse 15 now it says and a voice came to him a second time what god has made clean do not call common this happened three times and the thing was taken up at once to heaven peter often needs things said to him three times doesn't he <laughs> he's got a problem with three times doesn't he right yes yeah, so i think that's just a funny little little aside you know how he needed to be restored three times after he denied christ three times and here we it takes three times for him to get the message here also um, praise God for Peter. I'm so glad he's in the Bible. It makes me feel so much better. <laughs> but here we have, what's God doing? Is this only about animals? No. He's preparing his heart. He's preparing him to see. Notice the phrase there, the most important phrase of what he says. What the Lord has made clean, do not call common or unclean, right? What, the, what God has made clean, do not call common common because he's talking about food here animals here but he's not just talking about food or animals he's preparing him to meet this unclean person who is about to come to faith in christ okay what was unclean is going to be made clean that's the picture now having said that i just want to bring us to attention to our attention in mark chapter 7 Jesus is talking about it's not what you eat that defiles you. Um, it's, it's what comes out of you that defiles you. And says, and uh, there's this little parenthetical statement that says, therefore he declared all foods clean. Okay, that's in um, Mark chapter 7. And then in Acts chapter 15, in the Jerusalem Council, there's, in fact, just turn here. We're already in Acts, right? So just go a few pages to 15. I want to make sure I read it correctly. It's like 19 and 20, I think. <coughs> Acts chapter 15, verses 19 and 20. There's this whole, you know, the Gentiles are coming to faith in Christ. You know, I'm spoiling a lot. Spoil alert. Okay, a bunch of Gentiles come to faith in Christ, right? And so it says, therefore, my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God. So there was a, an idea of, of, do they need to get circumcised? Do they need to follow the law? Do they need to do all the, you know what I'm saying? Do they need to keep all the dietary restrictions? How do we handle these Gentiles? They're not Jews and they're coming to faith and all these things. And so, and he says, but we should write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from what has been strangled, and from blood okay you see the dietary laws were not continued that's the point that i'm trying to make so that not though this was about more than just rise peter kill and eat it was not less than that either that in this sense he's saying do that and i think one of the reasons why that is is because when you're reaching the nations not all the nations have unclean animal or clean animals in them, right? If you go to China, what are they eating mostly? Like they eat a lot of shrimp and shrimp flavored things. Well, shrimp's off the menu for a Jewish, you know, person keeping the kosher law. And I think what he's doing is he's preparing for the gospel going to all cultures. It's not about the people in Papua New Guinea have to eat lamb now. It's no, they can still eat whatever they're eating there, which I guarantee you is not kosher. And they're not going to be defiled because the gospel is now going to all the earth. And we have a difference now. And the ceremonial laws and the holiness code has been fulfilled in Christ. The moral law is continuous, right? We still keep the Ten Commandments. And I think we still, in our society, should base our laws off of the 613 positive and negative commands as well. I think that we need to pay attention to those things. Like, if you steal, you should make restitution well, okay, that's still applicable, I think, you know, but we don't have are things like you can't wear two different threads, you know, woven together. You can do that now. You see what I'm saying? You don't praise God. Bacon is gospel food, right? Jesus died and now bacon's okay to eat. Praise the Lord, right? So, so, so we have this wonderful privilege that comes from that. 
But the point is, is he's illustrating that as well as showing Peter that he's about to do something here. You see, he's about to do something that would be unthinkable to Peter. So to prepare him for sort of the greater thing here, he's given them a lesser thing saying, I'm not, I, I, now I'm making things that were once unclean for you, clean for you. Okay. Clean by what? By the gospel of Jesus Christ, of course. Verse 17, Now while Peter was inwardly perplexed as to what the vision that he had seen might mean, behold, the men who were sent by Cornelius, having made inquiry for Simon's house, stood at the gate and called out to ask whether Simon, who was called Peter, was lodging there. I love it. And both times, you know, we see, you see them both in prayer, right? And as Peter is in prayer, that's when the people show up. That's when the people show up. And while he was pondering the vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are looking for you. Rise and go down and accompany them without hesitation, for I have sent them. And Peter went down to the men and said, I am the one who you're looking for. What is the reason for your coming? And they said, Cornelius, a centurion, an upright and God-fearing man who is well spoken of by the whole Jewish nation, was directed by a holy angel to send for you to come to his house and to hear what you have to say. So he invited them in to be his guests. I think that that last little sentence is a picture that Peter's already getting it. Why? Because a Jewish person would never invite Gentiles to come into his house to be his guests and to eat. That was a major scandalous thing that Peter did just right there. We haven't even gotten to Cornelius yet. But praise God that Peter was able to make that assessment and figure out what was happening there. And he invited them in to be the guests. Notice how the, the report matches the beginning, right? This is talking about Cornelius and they give the same sort of report. And so the idea is that God has providentially, sovereignly linked all of this together. Why? Why? Because he's continuing to fulfill his plan of redemption according to what he said in Acts chapter 1 verse 8. Now we're going to get to the fulfillment of that part next week as we look at Cornelius' conversion and, and how he comes to faith in Christ and his whole household is baptized and things like that. But I want us to understand that this all happened because of how God sovereignly worked all of this out. This wasn't Cornelius is a pretty cool dude. He's a good guy. Go ahead and let him in. You know, it wasn't that. It wasn't that. It wasn't, the church is failing to reach the Gentiles. I better send a vision to Peter to make sure that that happens. It's not that either. No, it's a picture of how God is sovereign over all of his creation, works out his redemption. Look, our God knows the, be the end from the beginning. Before he even said, let there be light, he knew what the end was going to be, you see? And so he is sovereignly working out all of these things according to his end, the end that he has sovereignly put into place. And so he is accomplishing it in real time, right here and right now in our lives, just as he was here. And so have you all ever had what you call a divine appointment before? <laughs> I've heard it called a divine appointment. I, I think it's a, good, it's a good term. Whenever you are out, you've been obedient to go out and start sharing the gospel with people, and then this person, you just, you just link up with this person, and then you're just preaching, and they're just getting it, and then they just come to faith in Christ. There was this wonderful, oh, it was so cool. Oh, this is my favorite story. I was in the inner city of Memphis, and we were preaching the gospel out on the streets and showing this ridiculous video, but it's an awesome video that's full of the Word of God, and a lot of people were saved because of it. And I'm just preaching the gospel to these guys in the street, and so I'm praying with them. They're, they're, they're accepting Christ, and right behind them are two more guys. So after, after, after they sort of like move on, then I start preaching to these two guys, and then as I'm sort of like praying with them and they're accepting Christ, two more guys show up behind them. And then, 
11 people, right? Like they're literally lining up to get saved. They're lining up to hear the gospel. Did I put them in there? No, I didn't put them in there. But God drew them according to his sovereign plan because that was their appointed time for salvation. There was a divine appointment that God had put together to see that, to do that. You don't get to see that stuff if you're not obedient to go share the gospel with people. I'm, I'm saying this not as a binding of your conscience, trying to make anyone feel guilty or anything like that. I'm saying that to say that when you're obedient to God and all the things he's commanded us to do, you get to see him do marvelous, spectacular things. And it brings such like gravity to your to your walk of salvation and it reminds you of his sovereignty and it reminds you that he's working and he's moving and it kind of gets your mind off of yourself and it kind of you start to dwell on what he's doing and it's amazing to see him work out these things and to get to be a part of it you know to get to be a part of these things that he he's doing and I think about this, this with Peter. Now, I mean, obviously, Peter saw a lot of ridiculously awesome things. I mean, he literally saw the resurrected Christ, right? But at the same time, I think about how how just Peter is just doing, you know, he's, he's being obedient. He's up in a tanner's house praying. And that's God one day is like, all right, it's time to accomplish this part of my plan of redemption. His plan of redemption is continuing. It's continuing. Our King Jesus is sovereignly ruling and reigning right now. We are in his millennial reign right now, I believe. Okay? I believe. I'm saying that he's sovereign over it all. And so and so he is still working out his plan of redemption here and now just as he is working out his plan of redemption as we read right here. Not the same way in the sense if we're not in an apostolic age right now, but we know that he is working these things out. And so we need to get in on that. We need to be receptive to that. We need to be continuing in these ordinary means of grace and the faithfulness that he's called us to be faithful in obedience. And we get to be a part of this wonderful redemption that God is bringing about in the whole earth. That we, by his incredible privilege, has invited us with him to participate. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for another testimony of how you and your glorious redemptive plan is displayed before us, Lord. How we have seen here the beginnings of how you brought out the redemption of the Gentiles. And Lord, I speak for, I think, almost everybody, if not everybody in this room, whenever I say that, Lord, we are so thankful that the redemption, the plan of God, the gospel has gone to the Gentiles because I think there are basically only Gentiles here, Lord. Thank you for the wonderful privilege of being brought into that fellowship that we have with you. That we who were once not a people have become a people. That we were who were once alienated from the promises of God, alienated from the covenant and the worship of God, have been brought into that through Jesus Christ our Lord. We thank you that we have been translated out of darkness into the kingdom of your beloved Son. We thank you that we are now with the, uh, the way that you described your people even in the wilderness, a kingdom of priests, Lord, a holy nation, a peculiar people, because we have obtained grace from you, Lord. I pray, Father, firstly, for any person in here who does not yet know Christ as Lord, who have not repented and believed the gospel, that they would do so, that they would be like Cornelius this morning, as we'll, or I guess as we'll see next week, Lord, that upon hearing the gospel would receive it and be saved, Lord. But I pray for all of us in here, Lord, that we would be faithful in the ordinary means of grace in the everyday working out of things in our lives, Lord, in the everyday ordinary faithfulness, Lord, to be obedient to you 
and thereby see your providence, your power, your glory displayed in us as we remain faithful to all that you're doing, Lord. Help us also to be in constant prayer for those who are far away from, from, from the cross, Lord, far away from Christ. Even those people who we might think, there's no way. Those people are so reprobate and so lost that there's no way that they'll ever be saved. Lord, we have no idea what you're working out according to your plan. We know that many people will be lost. But Lord, help us not to give up on praying for them. May, if, they, if they are going to be lost, may they have to struggle through our prayers and our preaching. May they climb over our love and compassion for them, Lord, to go to hell. And may it, may it not be a, an easy transition for them. May we get in their way as much as we can to try to prevent them from going, Lord. May we have that heart of compassion. Father, I pray now that you would fellowship with us, meet with us during this time. Thank you for the privilege and the blessing of communion that we may, um, that we may fellowship with you during this time. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.